Great. Okay, let's pray, everybody. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the outpouring of your spirit in this new covenant age in Christ. And we pray, Lord God, we really pray, I really pray, Lord God, you speak to us and you lead us and guide us. And may we experience today the blessings of your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name we ask. Amen. Right, slightly different day today. Um, I popped myself on the, uh, on the prayer list at the beginning. Uh, I didn't explain why, but uh, I thought I would use it as a bit of an introduction to uh, the sermon, um, but just to explain where we're at. Uh, on Friday night, I, for no apparent reason, I just picked up one of our dogs. I was messing around, I confess to you. I picked up one of our dogs and suddenly my heart started like absolutely pounding. Like, you know, maybe, I would guess about 200 beats per minute. And it just stayed like that for maybe seven, eight, nine minutes. And I didn't know what's going on. I'm thinking, is this the beginning of a heart attack? What's going on? Just didn't stop. Absolutely pounding. Like, I thought, ugh. sat down, took some deep breaths, told Josh what was going on. Sarah wasn't in at the time. Had a drink of water, but thinking, what's going on? Now, in the past, I've always had uh, my, I get heart flurries and I've had an irregular heartbeat and things like that. But at that moment, I thought, this is new. What's going on here? Anyway, we phoned 111. Uh, it, oh, sorry, I should say, suddenly it stopped as soon as it had started. For no apparent reason, it suddenly went back to normal uh, and all was okay. But I thought I'd phone 111 and, uh, and so I did and they gave me an appointment on, uh, on, uh, on Saturday morning. So I went to the uh, Edge at Health Centre in, in, in Oadby. They did it and waited, they did a load of tests, took a load of blood. Uh, they weren't happy enough with my blood sample for, for a scientific reason. So they sent me to a &E yesterday, so I sat in a &E, had more blood taken. It's a wonder I didn't pass out, because I had about seven, eight, nine vials of blood taken yesterday. Um, and uh, eventually they did the whole test over again, and a scan of my heartbeat, etc, etc. Uh, and then I went home, and I was home sort of early. Uh, well, I went for a cup of coffee after, actually, after all that, but then I, I was home early evening. Now, I say all that for two reasons. One, <laughs> What is to explain that yesterday didn't go as planned, okay? So, um, I had a very different day planned yesterday to the one that ended up happening. So rather than spending like eight or nine hours uh, sat in an emergency health, uh, health center or in A&E, uh, there was other things planned. And so by the time I got home in the evening, I just, uh, I, I, I finished off the, the leading preparation for the service, but as partly as a result of all that, I haven't got to talk. So, yesterday was very different. Lots of it was spent in hospital, so I haven't really got to talk today. That's the first reason, that's the intro, so that you can, <laughs> if you pick that up, yeah, yeah, if you pick that up, it's kind of part of the reason why. But the second reason is just, uh, I guess I've been reminded very much recently about our frailty. About our frailty. Um, and we're frail in many, many different ways. Uh, we're frail physically, um, we're, we're, we're flawed spiritually, we can be erratic emotionally, we can not think clearly when it comes to our brain. In all sorts of different ways, there's a frailty about us as human beings, as fallen human beings, struggling, uh, struggling with things, uh, that extends wider than we might imagine. But things like that remind me uh, of our frailty and our weakness. And I was thinking about how frail, uh, kind of having had um, a difficult couple of years for mental health reasons, how frail I feel kind of in terms of my outreach and my evangelism. There was a time when I'd be sat in a hotel, hotel. there was a time I might be sat in a hospital waiting room where I think, I should might start a conversation with this person. Maybe I could end up talking about Jesus with them or something like that. But I haven't felt that that naturally recently. I haven't felt talkative. Quite aside from the evangelism side of things, I just haven't felt as talkative. There's confidence it's just not quite there in the same way. So the thought doesn't even occur to me. So we're frail. We can get buffeted about. We can get knocked about. Now, what's this got to do with Pentecost? Well, first thing I want to say all about that is one of the key things I realised and noticed 
about the, uh, what happens at Pentecost is around Peter. We are always tempted to think that the Bible characters, that the people we read about in the scriptures had it together. Okay? They had it together and they, they were used by God because they had it together. You do not see that though in the Bible. Peter was the person who, uh, Peter was the person who said, I will go to the gallows with you, Jesus, but I won't deny you, and then he denied him. And he denied him three times. But here he is, after Pentecost, and the Holy Spirit is poured out, he is the one who stands up before that huge crowd of people, declares the truth about Jesus, and he is kind of taking that position of leading the rest of the disciples and the apostles. And he's filled with boldness, and he's filled with love and power, because the Holy Spirit has been poured out. The difference between a fruitful Christian and a not fruitful Christian is not their competence, not their natural competence, it is their dependence on the power and presence of the living God. That's the difference. If you read about the stories of the saints and the churches down the ages, my guess is you will find they were weak people who God took hold of and transformed. That should be our experience as well. That is in whom we place our hope. First thing I want to say on that front, therefore, about Pentecost, I want to draw your attention to a couple of words. Oh, I should say before I do that, we're actually going to do Pentecost in two weeks. Next week is about Pentecost as well when Jesse comes. And we're going to think a little bit about the kind of the Pentecost aspect being a bringing together of all of the nations. All that list of nations that Helen gave us before. How God is bringing people back together as he reconciles them to himself. And also about the gift of tongues and the speaking in many languages, which is very much a part of that. All of that we kind of touch on next week. But for now, what I want us to see here is just in verses 17 and 18. Is the truth that there is only one kind of Christian and it is a Holy Spirit filled, dependent upon Jesus Christ type of Christian. Verse 17, Peter says to the crowd, In the last days, God says, I will pour out my Spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy, your young men will see visions, your old men will dream dreams. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my Spirit in those days and they will prophesy. Okay. I'm not going to go into detail about what prophesy means and dreams and stuff. I believe all that happened then. I believe it continues to happen now. I believe that the gifts here are for the church down the ages. But I just want to focus on the word all. I will pour my spirit on all people. Sons and daughters, young men and old men, servants, men, women, everyone. The Old Testament... Pouring out the anointing of the Holy Spirit tends to be reserved for specific people. King David, the, the King David would be an example. Specific, specific anointing for a specific purpose. This, however, Peter is taking a quote from uh, the prophet Joel, and he's saying that a time will come, Joel said, a time will come when the Spirit will be poured out on all flesh, on all people, all types of people. And what I want you to get from that is that there is only one type of Christian. There is only one type of follower of Jesus Christ and we have got to get it. The Holy Spirit filled, born again, Jesus, truster type of Christian. That's the only one there is. Now, um, I'll say why I think that's important in a moment. But just to say, there's a little bit of a... a like, sometimes you, you might hear people speak about this experience in a certain way, in a different way. Like, you know, the, the, uh, the disciples had been following Jesus uh, for many, many years, and it's only at the point of Pentecost where they're filled with the Spirit. Therefore, is that kind of the pattern for us as well? Well, I've had a good look at this in Scripture, and I think my own feeling is that what basically we should get is that this is the beginning of the age of the Holy Spirit. This point, this day, do you remember we've been doing God's big picture, right? We know that God is unfolding a plan down the ages. 
And how he works in different ages is going up, 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 up towards the crescendo, which is the new heavens and the new earth, where we are transformed, Holy Spirit filled, a new body given the believers in Christ. This mark, Pentecost marks the beginning of this age of the Holy Spirit, where the kingdom of the future, God's kingdom in the future breaks into the present, and we get a real experience of God's eternal kingdom. Okay? So this specifically, I think, is the beginning of a new age. Now, that new age of the Holy Spirit arrived partway through those first disciples' lives. Okay? There were, what, 20 or 30 or maybe some of them 40 or 50. So this, point, this new age of the Holy Spirit starts partway through their lives. But for us, and I think the rest of the New Testament bears this out, when we come to Christ, when we are converted to Christ, we receive the Holy Spirit. That Pentecost experience comes to us at the point that we believe, when we come to Christ. Because that is the nature of a new covenant believer. Some Pentecostals believe slightly differently, that you can have subsequent Baptism in the Holy Spirit. I prefer to think of it in terms of we all receive the Holy Spirit when we come to Christ, but we can have subsequent experiences of the Holy Spirit. We can be filled with the Holy Spirit. And in fact, we're told to continually be filled with the Spirit. So that's my understanding of it. So that means that in this last age, this age now that we're in of the Holy Spirit, we all are given the gift of God's Holy Spirit in us. That's important because we have a tendency to make ranks in the church. Every church has got their own versions of it. Some of the more obvious versions of it, you might think of kind of Roman Catholicism, they've got the, the regular lay people, they've got the priests, then they've got the saints, etc, etc, they've got the Pope at the top, and it's very, very hierarchical, but actually, I think most denominations do it, Okay? You can have like, you've got your regular, some churches, evangelical churches might have, well, you've got your regular believers over here, then you've got your disciples over here. Or, as I've said, in some Pentecostal churches, you have your regular Christians, and then you have your spirit baptized Christians. You could see it across the board. But what I think this is telling us is that everyone now has access to the Holy Spirit living within us, bringing us into the life of the Trinity. It says elsewhere in the New Testament, doesn't it? We cry out, Abba, Father, by the Spirit of Sonship that we've received. The same Spirit that Jesus had, we have. The same relationship that Jesus had with the Father, and as he praised him and obeyed him through the power of the Spirit, we have. We get brought into that relationship. We have the same status as Jesus Christ. We get brought into that relationship, into the life of the triune God. That's what this is saying. So know that today. If you are trusting in Jesus Christ, this is for you. This is for you. Second thing I just want to say is that we are utterly, utterly dependent on the Holy Spirit to experience all of God's blessings in Jesus Christ. The Ezekiel passage, maybe not often connected to, uh, to Pentecost very often, but I hope you can see why uh, I have selected it too. So that's Ezekiel 36. I'll just read it again briefly. Where is it? There we go. I will sprinkle clean water on you and you will be clean. I will cleanse you from all your impurities and from all your idols. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. I will remove from you your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit in you and move you to follow my decrees and be careful to keep my laws. We see in the Acts passage the Holy Spirit's power to give boldness and power in proclaiming the gospel of Jesus. 
But we see in passages like the Ezekiel passage that the work of God, the work that God wants us to do, the work of being cleansed of sin, the work of being given a new heart, the work of, the work of having no longer a heart of stone but a heart of flesh, that inward transformation of our motivations and our desires and our inclinations and all of that stuff which we, in our more honest moments, we know we need, that is available. We've been given it. We have been given it. We depend utterly on God. Right from the point of believing in Christ, all the way through to, every, to, the, to your life in glory, in the new heavens and new earth, and every sense of godliness, every experience of transformation, everything is dependent on Jesus, on Jesus Christ's work in us by the Holy Spirit. We can't, we can't do anything without him. And in a sense, that's why I'm thankful of experiences which bring me to that place of going, I know I can't do this. I know I'm afraid. I know I'm weak. It's like I said last week, so what? He's not afraid and he's not weak. And through the Holy Spirit's presence and power in your life, you have been brought into the life of Christ. Brought in. All the blessings that are in Jesus Christ are yours. Including the transformation to be like him. One of the things uh, which was really encouraging, uh, probably two years ago, whenever we did Saints Alive, two years ago, two and a half, two and a half years ago, for those of you who weren't around, what we did in our uh, Lent course, not this one just gone, well, it doesn't really matter when it was, it was one of our Lent courses over two or, two or three years back. Uh, and Saints Alive, we really got a lot out of it. It's a, it's a, a course that's been around for a while, and it's thinking about uh, the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives, and what it means to be a disciple of Jesus Christ. And uh, there's one moment at the end, towards the end, where uh, they say, okay, well this week we're going to pray for each other to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Um, it's not something we've ever done before. I've never done this course before. I've done plenty of, I've, in other contexts, I've prayed for people to be filled with the Spirit and to experience God thing. But it's the first time it's in Christmas, I think we've done it kind of like where we set aside time to do it. And we weren't sure how um, everyone got prayed for everyone, so it wasn't just me or Charles or whoever praying for people and not getting prayed for. We were prayed for, every, people were prayed for, I got prayed for, etc. But one of the really touching moments was when uh, we prayed for a certain church member, I won't say who they were, and uh, uh, this church member is not particularly prone to being uh, uh, like emotive or sort of like, you know, sharing intimate, like an intimate experience of God. And uh, we prayed, came down the front, laid on hands, we prayed for filling of the Holy Spirit, and uh, this person just went dead quiet. Just went absolutely still and quiet for ages and ages. And uh, I remember Charles was trying to talk to them and there was no response. They were just kind of, as them and the Lord. Uh, it was really, really lovely to watch. And then they just got up and they said, uh, hmm, I did feel very close to Jesus. Which I just thought was so lovely. It's not the kind of thing this person would normally say. I did feel very close to Jesus. That's the Holy Spirit's ministry. The love and the blessing and the intimacy of knowing Jesus Christ, of being with him. All of that, all of that life brought to us. I did feel very, very close to Jesus Christ. <laughs> I think I'm going to leave it there. I think I'm going to pray and leave it there. We're going to have, like we normally do, a, uh, a, a, in a little bit while, like we normally do these days, have a little bit of time of silence to invite the Lord to be at work um, and to invite His Holy Spirit to minister to us. Um, and we are going to do that, but uh, we'll, we'll do that and we'll see, see where it takes us. Um, let's pray and then we will uh, confess our sins together.
Father, Father, we confess that we are, we try, we are very self-dependent in different ways. But we thank you, Lord God, that the promise of power and of life that is in Pentecost. Lord, that is a promise for us. We pray, Lord God, we would pursue your life. We would seek to be filled with the Spirit all our days in humble trust. Help us to do so in Jesus' name. Amen.